Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have uh, an exciting program for the afternoon. So we're going to start with the panel of uh, Steve's colleagues at MIT and the former students, uh, sharing our experiences with him as a collaborator and advisor. And uh, then that will be followed by a section on Steve's contributions to capital markets. And there we are going to hear from uh, three speakers, uh, Phil Divick, a Boatman's Bank Shares Professor in Banking and Finance uh, from the Olin School, and uh, Mark Greenblatt, Distinguished Professor of Finance at UCLA Anderson School, and uh, our own Andrew Lowe. Um, he is uh, Charles and Susan Harris Professor of Finance at uh, MIT. So with that, uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, going from the other end, John Wang, Professor at MIT, uh, John Cox as well, and uh, Marco DiMaggio, and uh, Ishal Errol, and uh, Jennifer Huang. And uh, the four of us were students of Steve at MIT at different points in time, and uh, John was also a student of Steve uh, at a slightly earlier point in time, and uh, John was uh, one of Steve's colleagues at MIT, of course. And uh, to begin with, uh, I would like to ask John to share some uh, recollections of uh, his experience with Steve at uh, UPenn and uh, the, those days. Thanks, Leonard. Well, Steve was such a remarkable fellow. That I'm sure many of you have strong memories of how you first met. Uh, I, that's certainly uh, what I have. Uh, and today, I wanted to talk a bit about how we met and came to write our first paper. It's an unusual story uh, because most of you met Steve either as his colleague or as his student, uh, but I was neither. Uh, and our meeting could have very easily uh, never happened. Uh, I knew Steve for over 40 years. We met at Penn in 1974. Uh, he was a junior professor in the economics department and I was a graduate student in the finance department. Now, Steve was a famously good teacher, but I never had a course from him. Uh, many people don't realize it, but in those early days, Steve didn't teach finance. Uh, instead, he taught general economics and uh, wrote papers on such things as international trade and industrial organization. His interest in finance was kind of a hobby on the side. Uh, and he, he told me later that the economics department was actually annoyed that he was wasting time on something so trivial as finance. Uh, uh, thanks to trailblazers like Steve, no one would say that today, but this was a long time ago. Um, and unlike many of you, I didn't have the good fortune to have Steve as an advisor. My thesis was finished before we met. I had seen Bob Merton's early working papers and decided to write my thesis using continuous time. And the finance faculty was aware of Bob's work, but they were still worried that there was some fatal flaw in my thesis. So they sent me over to have it checked out by this young fellow in economics. Okay. And when I took my uh, thesis over to Steve. He was running off somewhere, so I just left it with him. And uh, in the meantime, this was bef right before the holidays. So in the meantime, uh, I got curious about another topic. Uh, the work on options at this time had all, uh, had all assumed uh, that the stock price followed a geometric Brownian motion. And uh, that process had continuous sample paths, and many people thought that that was essential to option pricing. Um, and I wondered uh, what would happen if instead we had the exponential of a Poisson process. And it turned out that the replication argument uh, could still be done, and it led to a val uh, an equation defining the value of the option but I couldn't solve the equation. So in January, when I went over for my meeting with Steve, I, I wanted to, to talk about the new problem and not my thesis. 
And soon we were completing each other's sentences because uh, uh, it turned out that Steve had already thought of exactly the same problem and gotten to exactly the same point, okay? So we quickly joined forces, uh, but uh, that didn't help. Uh, we, still, we still couldn't solve the equation, okay? Uh, now, I, I was having so much fun just talking with Steve that I didn't really mind the, the lack of progress. But you know how competitive Steve was. Uh, he wanted some action. Um, so the next step was to take the problem then to two professors in the Penn Math Department that Steve knew. And one of them got really interested uh, in um, the problem, but uh, he couldn't solve it either. Okay, so uh, Black and Schultz and Merton all had explicit solutions to their, equ uh, to their equations. So we felt that we had to have one too. Um, but we needed a new approach. And we thought, and we said, well, you know, we're just not as good as mathematicians, uh, uh, mathematicians as those guys in the math department, but we're better economists. Uh, so maybe we should give up trying to solve this as a math problem and think about what economics could do for us. And Steve was confident that the economic structure of the problem could might somehow g give us an edge. And uh, it did. You know, as we thought about what was going into the problem, um, we had assumed nothing about other stocks. But it turned out that that didn't lead anywhere. Okay? And we had also assumed nothing about risk preferences. Uh, and that turned out to be the key. Okay. It meant that the answer had to be the same for all risk preferences, including the most convenient and simplest one, risk neutrality. Okay. And uh, the valuation equation itself would then specify how the risk neutrality should be imposed. And so that uh, is how we were able to quickly solve the problem and come up with the idea of risk neutral valuation. You know, it's a general idea that can be applied uh, in any uh, circumstances in which replication is possible. And it gave a step uh, in uh, the uh, complete formulation of valuation by arbitrage uh, that was done later by Harrison and Krebs. Okay, so that's the story of how I came to be uh, Steve's first co-author and have the, the pleasure of working with him. Um, now look back on it, I see how much luck was involved, that it was, it was lucky that we met at all, and even luckier that we happened to be thinking about the same problem at the same time, okay? And I think uh, most of you can Th go back over, well, think of one incident uh, in your life where you can say, well, if that hadn't happened, my whole career would be different. That's the way I always felt about meeting Steve. Thank you, John. So, uh, John and I also had the privilege of working with Steve on uh, joint research, and maybe I'll let John uh, speak about uh, our work on uh, irrational traders and uh, survival and price impact. Say a few words about that. <clears throat> I guess um, I guess a lot of us here are students of Steve, uh, one way or the other. Uh, uh, certainly, um, <clears throat> as a graduate student, you know, I spent a lot of time to read uh, Steve's work. I guess the first time I met him was actually at Yale when I was on job market. Um, certainly, uh, but, you know, I was incredibly impressed, not just by you know his knowledge of finance, but uh, on many other things as well, because I was also uh, trained as a you know a physicist. So uh, <clears throat> his years at uh, Caltech, he had very fond memories of. So, um, and uh, I guess I almost became his student uh, when he came here because he started teaching this introductory uh, course to uh, financial economics. And uh, before before that, I was teaching that. Because at that time, 
uh, we had this uh, arrangement that the junior faculty actually was starting uh, teaching the PhD courses so that they have the chance to meet the graduate students. <clears throat> of course, I thought that this would be a great opportunity for me to learn a lot of the material that I was supposed to teach actually from the person who uh, created a lot of it. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the first class, I was on sabbatical that year, the first year he was here and uh, I was trying to you know, get to the classroom. Uh, usually for this course, even though it attracts not just the finance PhD students, but also students from the economics department, also from Harvard and so on, uh, usually you get somewhere between 10 to 20 students. <clears throat> and that year, I think we anticipated there would probably be a bigger crowd, so we had a classroom roughly about 50 students. So I was, you know, <clears throat> walking toward the classroom, realized that there's, the over, <laughs> there's a big crowd outside the classroom. I peeked into the window, and all the seats were taken. People were standing, and there were still people waiting outside trying to get in. So Steve was walking by and said, well, you can't take it this year. You have to uh, come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I actually missed, missed that opportunity to take uh, that course from him, uh, unfortunately, later on, because our teaching skills, uh, teaching schedules conflict with that course. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I should, I, I should uh, also add, uh, uh, you know, this, this semester, Lian and I actually uh, picking up that course uh, from him. And uh, so, you know, I went through uh, his notes. Uh, he actually had a fantastic set of notes. Uh, very much reminds me of the Feynman lectures, actually, uh, in, in many ways, uh, many of his other writings as well. <clears throat> um, certainly, uh, you know, when he joined MIT, I was, uh, was so thrilled uh, uh, to have him here. Um, and uh, I guess by luck, I, I've been his, uh, I guess, office neighbor ever since he's been here, from the old building to, to this building. So as a colleague, I uh, benefit a lot <clears throat> from just you know, conversations uh, with him. Uh, I mean, he's uh, just full of uh, energy and, uh, and wisdom. And uh, uh, his office, usually it's a little bit inside the corridor. So you will see that whenever he's He's in town, you know, he's most, most often standing by the door chatting with, um, you know, one of our colleagues uh, on a whole range of issues. Um, and uh, also because of teaching schedule, I usually go to lunch with uh, seminar speakers and uh, uh, for the semester that Steve is here, uh, I think that uh, more than half the time he, he joins uh, lunch with speakers and uh, take uh, junior colleagues to, uh, <clears throat> to dinners and so on. So he's really, around and um, you know, we all benefit uh, tremendously. Um, you know, coming back to, to this research, uh, certainly this is actually, um, ever since you got to hear, uh, this was a period where uh, behavioral finance actually was uh, <clears throat> uh, growing very, very fast. And, uh, uh, you know, Steve uh, <clears throat> had, you know, his thoughts on sort of, you know, uh, what that literature, re literature really means uh, for finance, in particular for, for pricing. And I guess he typically had this comment, he often find many of the theoretical work in that literature, uh, the distance between the assumptions and the, and the conclusions were a little too close. <clears throat> um, so one of the problems actually we started talking about with Leonard and uh, also uh, Mark Westerfield at that time was a PhD student here, was um, if these people behave in, in an irrational fashion in the market, um, wouldn't they be kind of eliminated uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, by the losses from their, their investment behavior? Um, and uh, earlier models tend to make some fairly strong assumptions uh, on people's behavior, typically with uh, short horizons, so that they wouldn't necessarily uh, <clears throat> take advantage of the deviations in prices um, by implementing uh, long-term strategies to benefit from these uh, deviations. Um, of course, that's probably uh, needed you know, to, to actually get a solution, but it always leaves you thinking that if you really put in um, arbitrage orders and so on, um, would they eventually correct the market? <clears throat> so we actually start trying to uh, construct a model to try to show that. Um, and. Uh, uh, fairly quickly, we realized that true. You know, these irrational investors, uh, their wealth share does decline over time. Except that if you calibrate it, it takes a long time—you know, <laughs> 20, 30 years or something. 
And uh, so it was sort of some kind of disappointing that, it, you know, yeah, it, you get the result, but it's, it's probably not going to uh, win the argument. And uh, so, so Steve and I were talking, and, you know, <clears throat> when we were looking at this result, he immediately realized, basically, well, this actually kind of makes sense because it's like if you have one sheep facing one hungry wolf, uh, there's no chance that the sheep will survive. Uh, but if it's facing a pack of wolves, hungry wolves, uh, maybe you know he will survive longer just because of the competition among you know among the wolves actually would uh, <laughs> protect the sheep, and we realize exactly that's exactly what's driving that because we're making a you know competitive assumption for the market, and we all know I mean this is actually at the end it's a trivial intuition that the market is efficient so you cannot make money, but you cannot lose money either because uh, you know the competitive prices uh, actually will protect you. <clears throat> Um, so, but, but then, you know, we uh, come back to the original question as to, despite the fact actually they would eventually uh, diminish in terms of uh, the, the wealth share, these irrational uh, investors, uh, what potentially could be, be their impact uh, on the prices? <clears throat> and this is where actually we find results that were quite different from what we uh, started with. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the impact of these irrational investors on prices could remain fairly large, not for you know, all kinds of prices, but you know, for, for certain kinds of prices, um, even when their wealth share uh, diminishes. Uh, for example, if you would use the arrow de Brew setting, if you have somebody who really irrationally believes a particular uh, bad state, that, that the probability is high than actually what can be justified objectively, uh, he will be paying a very high price for it, and that just you know, won't go away. Um, <clears throat> And in, that, in a dynamic setting, actually, there will be you know, um, states of the world down the road that actually this um, will become more important. Um, so what I actually find uh, you know, very um, sort of impressive about Steve is that despite sort of his prior views, uh, I'm not sure this result ultimately changed his view <laughs> on this topic, uh, he was incredibly open to it, and he actually was very excited. Actually, we were able to uh, <clears throat> find this result, and then to uh, very quickly provide the intuition uh, behind it. Uh, but then, of course, uh, ultimately, there will still be questions as to you know the assumptions that we made were they actually reasonable? Because uh, that paper, to a large extent, is just a, a, a example to illustrate the potential uh, mechanisms. Um, so. Uh, you know, I think that uh, what I've uh, really learned uh, through that process is that he's really uh, going after the truth, uh, despite whatever sort of prior, prior uh, you know, sort of views or guesses he might have at the beginning. Um, and uh, I think that's really something that, uh, and that we should uh, <laughs> we should all follow. Yeah, if uh, I can add, uh, I've heard some comments from people. Uh, <coughs> really surprised to see Steve's name in this paper because this just doesn't mesh with his reputation <laughs> as the defender of uh, efficient markets in neoclassical finance. But of course, the two are not at odds uh, because his beliefs are more about uh, empirical behavior in the market. This, he was uh, always emphasizing that, yeah, there are some opportunities for making money, but not a whole lot. So that the first approximation, markets are pretty efficient in that sense. But uh, here we're talking about properties of models. And uh, if they don't apply result, then it's not there. And I remember when we talked to him, he was saying, these people, uh, these Russian people are really hard to kill, huh? And uh, it's like, yeah, they just don't go away. Uh, and uh, we could have rigged the model to make them go away, but we didn't, uh, it, because essentially that would be sort of cheating. We started with the most natural setting, removed limits to arbitrage, and we found out that it's uh, nuanced behavior. It doesn't always drive away rational people. Most of the time it does, but not always. And we just uh, stuck with that as the conclusion. Uh, if I could add my own experience meeting Steve, it's uh, much less academic, much less sort of illustrious, but it uh, basically happened uh, before he came to MIT. Uh, I was at the student conference at UMass Amherst, and uh, I was attending. And uh, Steve was a lunch speaker. He was uh, giving an empirical paper. It was kind of surprising because I knew him from uh, his work, but as a theorist. And he was giving an empirical paper about survivorship bias. And uh, to intrigue the audience, he started the paper by asking a question, like a trivia question, uh, about what were the largest stock markets in the world at the beginning of the 20th century. And the kicker is that Russia was one of the largest markets. And then, of course, 20 years later, it disappeared altogether. And so that was the lesson uh, in a nutshell. And that he did a bunch of statistics to kind of 
at some meat to this, but that was essential at the point of the paper. And then a couple of years later, he was giving the same paper internal at MIT, and of course he asked the same question. Um, and before I have a chance to think about my strategy, he actually looks at me and says, that, but you already heard the answer, so you shouldn't respond. At which point I realized he actually, for some reason, remembered me from that uh, meeting, which was very odd because uh, it was just a crowd of junior PhD students, but uh, he was paying attention to the audience and somehow he remembers things that you don't think he would. So this is kind of one of his quirky qualities that he just seemed to know everything about anything and he knew so many people. I felt like my degree of separation was like two point something essential to everyone in the world <laughs> because of knowing Steve and uh, that was quite <laughs> remarkable. So uh, let me uh, ask uh, our panel members uh, about uh, their experiences, basically how did uh, interaction with Steve influence your own research as a colleague or advisor? If you want, I can start. Or Please. You. So, I mean, as many of the people here probably, uh, I met Steve uh, as a PhD student. I was a PhD student at MIT Econ, and I went through his class, his first year course in, um, in finance. And I remember uh, a certain point deciding for this transition from econ to finance and going to Bank Armstrong and asking him, what should I do? I mean, I am in an econ department that I'm looking for somebody to do some finance uh, and uh, somebody that actually would listen to me. And uh, Bank replied saying, you should go and talk with Steve immediately because he's the guy to go to. So I remember going there, being very uh, you know, uh, afraid of what he could tell me. Uh, and so I going to his office, uh, and that's sort of his uh, quality all over our relationship of being extremely personal and making me feel very comfortable. And so he understood that I was shy and I was sort of afraid of, uh, you know, he was Steve Ross. Uh, this is like 2008, 2009. And uh, immediately pick up my British accent uh, and, uh, <laughs> and he starts making jokes about the fact that uh, his daughter also speaks uh, Italian because uh, she had a, an Italian boyfriend. Uh, and so we start sort of bonding on, the, on that and the fact that he was visiting uh, Italy for a while and he knew a lot of places, he knew exactly the, the places to go to, to eat both in Italy and in the US. And that sort of makes me feel, like, at the time made me feel very comfortable, it makes me sit. And then we start talking and the first question he asked me is that, uh, so you were in my class, right? And so which grade did you get? which was a very uncomfortable question, but <laughs> <laughs> lucky enough, I, I, I did well. And so his reply was, okay, so the people that do well in that class or become millionaires or become academic, why are you here? Uh, <laughs> can I have a little bit of both? Uh, <laughs> so that, that was sort of our first meeting. Uh, and uh, he was like that all over uh, his, uh, his you know, 10 years that uh, I've known him for. And I remember a few other things, like why, for example, uh, you know, he was passionate about everything. And uh, one of the best memories that I have from the, the PhD time was um, after getting finally a job in the job market, he took me and my wife out for dinner. And we went to Eben Lewis Steakhouse here in Boston. And uh, I remember, you know, all that conversation about both uh, how positive it was about, you know, looking forward at the future and what, you know, I, I should, we should have achieved as a family and so on. And also his passion for wine, that the, he also transmitted it uh, uh, to me as much as the, the passion for finance, just because he was so much into, you know, being positive and being uh, open to his thoughts and being open to others' thoughts as well. Um, uh, even, and the last thing, the last time that I met him was uh, uh, in a, last year, um, we went out for lunch. And one thing that I remember, that sort of remembered, uh, you know, it reminded me of the whole experience with him as an advisor, was uh, how close he thought the finance academia should be to practitioner. And I remember his line saying, I don't understand why assistant professors thinks that they should not do co any consulting. Uh, consulting should be the, you know, the sort of a big portion of uh, uh, what you have to achieve uh, during these years because that's where you get uh, some of your best ideas. That's where you can actually implement some of these ideas. Uh, and so he was sort of uh, pushing me to be away from looking at the related literature and being closer to uh, the, practi the practitioner's uh, world. And if I can say just the last thing that uh, uh, it always uh, shocked me at the time was uh, uh, some people told me why 
picking Steve uh, as an advisor. He was sort of older, he was here only one semester a year. People were thinking, uh, well, you know, you should pick somebody who can actually read your papers and be close to you and mentor you. Um, well, no advice was more wrong than that one. I remember November of my job market here, uh, the time where probably he was writing the letters. I remember this phone call on, me, on my cell phone at the time, and I was obviously freaking out. And he starts saying, uh, Marco, I think there is a problem. Um, proposition eight, I have a doubt. Uh, he says, I think this should be greater than, rather than greater, uh, less than. And uh, is that a typo? Yes, it's a typo, Steve, it's a typo. <laughs> so, I mean, the level of details, I actually never got it from anyone else. Uh, and it was just amazing. Uh, and also, you know, that transmitted me to the same sort of passion for the students that now start coming to, to, to my office now. I, I think uh, I, will say this, I will say similar things as well. So my interaction with Steve started also uh, when I took his course, his uh, uh, introduction to finance course during my first year. I was lucky to get the top grade. Uh, I was lucky mm -hmm. because I'm talking to this group of people now and I was all, also because um, he met me in his office and he said, okay, sure, now we can talk about finance. Um, and then our interaction started, I became his RA, um, he became my advisor and then uh, a co-chair of my thesis. Um, there are so many things to tell about Steve's mentorship. Um, I will try to focus on a few and there will be some repetitions here. Um, I think his um, exceptional talent uh, in modeling difficult problems in the, uh, in the simplest way amazed me all the time. Um, I think he taught us uh, how to differentiate uh, the fundamental from the marginal and the essence, the key to solving important problems uh, is uh, looking at them in, a, in the most simplest way ever. Uh, I remember I was writing a model and taking to him and he was like, um, simple, sure, simpler, simpler. And I was thinking I was approaching in the most simple way. Um, and he also valued analytical thinking a lot. I did not have a background in math or physics and I was worried about that. And I was asking him, you know, would that be a problem? Um, and he was saying, no, you can think analytically very well and it is uh, not a, a skill that not everybody has and you should use this and do theory. He loved theory. First, I should have listened to him. Uh, I ended up writing an empirical corporate finance paper, a uh, job market paper, half of my thesis was theory. Um, and he helped me with empirical corporate finance a lot as well. Um, he read my papers in detail, uh, gave me great suggestions on identification. Um, and, um, and the second thing that I would like to talk about him is his um, everlasting positive energy and calming behavior. I think that is uh, uh, what we keep hearing uh, since the morning. Um, his always posit positive attitude was so encouraging for us. Um, he was here only for a few days every month. But there was no problem. He was asking me to call him with, up, with up, updates. And some, some, sometimes I was calling him with, in a panic mode, you know. It was, I was sure that there, it was a disaster, there was a serious problem. And he managed to calm me down in a few minutes and made me smile each time. Um, uh, I will never forget his voice saying, oh, isn't it a very nice day, show? Like, think about this first. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he loved to chat about uh, his personal life. He saw us as friends, so he always shared uh, photos of his grandkids. Uh, I remember his leather um, wallet, uh, um, a photo wallet, uh, full of pictures uh, from his grandchildren, uh, and he was sharing those with us. Um, um, and lastly, um, uh, he was, um, his mentorship did not end when we graduated, so I think it was a lifelong mentorship. Um, he always cared about, uh, about us. Um, whenever I did not attend the Farfi conference, for example, I would receive an email from him in two days and asking what I am doing, why I did not attend. Um, he called me within 10 minutes after my departmental tenure meeting to congratulate me. So he had very good connections everywhere. <laughs> uh, uh, and he deeply cared about our success. That's great. I 
you realize it's hard to go last. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, you know, I think, um, my interaction, I guess I was the lucky, that when John described that uh, humongous PhD class, I was a lucky TA for that course. So I get to take <laughs> it again. <laughs> but I took it with John, and, and then, you know, it, I think I got the most out of the class, because, you know, at some point he asked me how the students were doing. And I was telling him, you know, for first year PhDs, I think they sort of get how the, the mechanics of solving the problems, but I don't think they get the intuition. And I still remember he was telling me, you know, Jennifer, that's totally fine. You, you know, you do the mechanics first, the intuition come later. And that's the line I always use for my students. Because, and really, really comforting for me. Because, you know, if it's, a, as a PhD student, it's really humbling to walk into a seminar room. And then within five minutes, you have all the senior faculties telling the speaker what the paper is about. Right, and then Steve always is one of them. And it's kind of, you know, you think I came from math, computer science background, and it's sort of, you know, this is something I lack. And I was worried, you know, is this something I ever gonna develop? And, you know, it's, this seems to be necessary for the profession. And it was really reassuring, so when Steve said that to me, it's, you know, you do the mechanics first, the intuition come later. And that's absolutely true, you know. Then later on when I work on those problems, I can, you know, even though without seeing the results, I can still work through the math. And it's actually, later on, I realized that's actually a better thing, you know. If you can see the results right away, I guess the distance from assumption and conclusion aren't very far. So sometimes a good model should tell you something you didn't know when you started out. So that was a, a nice um, interaction. And the other thing I want to share, um, it's, uh, and everyone, I think, Annette talked about Steve being extremely positive. And he has this natural gift to motivate people. I was, I was already in my third or fourth year when Steve uh, joined um, MIT, and I have the best advisor. John was my advisor. I, I was lucky to have two of the best advisors in the world. But they're so, I mean, they're both extremely nice person, but very different. John was, um, sorry, but John was, you know, I could sit hours in his office and he's totally open door. And he would try to spend hours to fix the problems of the model for me. And I always remember, you know, walking out of his office a little bit depressed. So like, how could I be so stupid, right? So, you know, you have the model and we try to fix it, you know, you'd be depressed for a day or two. Then I gave it back to work. And then with Steve, it's kind of, you know, he was busy and I was, it was a long line outside of his office. And I was lucky because I was a TA, I have the privilege to get part of his time every week, which is to walk with him from office to classroom and back. Mm -hmm. so, so we get to talk for 10 minutes during the time. And I would, he would be, you know, he would always, and you know you cannot just say, okay, this is a great, you know, pat on the back, it doesn't work, right? So, but he would be able to tell you why your paper is great. And, you know, it's so brilliant, and you know, it solved the puzzle he was always wondering about, you know, so, and then maybe you can try this, and then the, this would be related to another problem he had, you know, he would like answers to. And I always remember feeling super excited after talking to him, pumped up, and I would work for two days straight. And then I realized you were saying exactly the same thing as John. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, it's amazing, you know, so week after week, it was a similar experience. So, and I used to think it was Steve's natural gift, you know, he's just a positive person. And it's, I think, Annette showed the video clip. It's really in 2007, you know, when he shared his experience, that I realized that was really a conscious choice on his part as well. He just thought, you know, he may not find something interesting, but that doesn't mean the problem is not interesting. He's humble. He says it's not for me to judge, you know, with, with his experience. And I think that's, uh, we're def I'm, I'm definitely a beneficiary of that determination. Yeah, Mark reminded me of some of the conversations we had with Steve. Uh, so he was definitely passionate about wine. And he brought an analytical approach to the subject sometimes. <laughs> I remember at some point he asked me, said, Leonid, have you ever tried comparing an old French Bordeaux with old uh, Californian Cabernet? And I was, uh, yeah, I, I guess not. Uh, he says, okay, this is what you should do. You take two bottles, open them side by side, and then you taste them for an hour, you'll see the difference. The very <laughs> experimental, I said, why don't you just tell me what the difference is going to be? Because I'll probably not run that experiment anytime soon. So he would say that, yeah, one of them, 
Californian wine starts off really impressive, uh, very flavorful, but then it doesn't last. It just fades away, and by that time, French wine opens up, even though it starts very close. So you can basically enjoy both. So it was great. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the other thing uh, he mentioned, uh, which uh, I think John may relate to, is that uh, he would go to these wine dinners after AFAs, I think, every year. And I heard about, about that. So basically, Steve and a few of his friends would get together. Each of them would bring some exotic wine, and then they would uh, drink them. And so I asked him, Steve, what if you bring your wine and it turns out corked? What are you going to do? So it's a good point. That's why I always bring two bottles. <laughs> the first one is cork. So he took this uh, quite seriously and uh, put thought into it. And now, uh, I know that uh, Jung wanted to maybe discuss some of the things, um, research things that uh, we talked about with Steve, uh, which may not be kind of in the public domain, but just his thoughts on um, some of his work, in particular the APT. Were you talking to me or Sean? Jung. Okay. Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, I guess this is so. In some sense, it's a, a kind of ongoing discussion with Steve uh, whenever you know he, he's around. Uh, certainly, I mean, I think we probably all agree. APT. Uh, I think it's one of the most uh, <coughs> uh, beautiful and uh, powerful ideas uh, uh, in asset pricing. Uh, but I guess using Steve's own words, there's some you know, technical complexities there. So, <clears throat> um, so often, because you know, uh, we certainly talk about uh, frictions, including you know, some of the comments that are uh, made in the morning, uh, you know, various frictions uh, in the market, uh, sort of the institutional context uh, will be a, a manifestation of that. So. Uh, so you know, often I try to kind of ask him as to what uh, his, his views are about really the validity of this idea, despite sort of the theoretical quibbles about it. Um, for example, if you were to uh, put frictions into, into a, a framework, would that still work? Um, or actually, if you put it into a dynamic context, uh, would the, the factors, the loadings, or the premiums change so much, actually, it would become uh, difficult to to reconcile with the data. I guess the question I asked him once was, how come that we still don't have a few fixed factors that could explain all the asset returns? You know, for equities, we have a few. For <laughs> fixed income, we have a few other. Um, and I think it's very open you know, to these dis discussions. Um, and uh, of course, I guess you know, we talked about potentially uh, working on something, hopefully, to uh, reconcile some of these, uh, some of these issues. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to get sort of too deep into the discussion. I guess we don't have any uh, concrete results to, to show. But I, what I find very uh, interesting, again, is that uh, you know, despite the success of, of the theory, uh, both uh, in research and also in practice, um, I think that uh, he's very much open to um, working on you know, potential limitations of it and also um, hopefully uh, ways to, to improve it. It's uh, also interesting that uh, even though Steve uh, made important contributions so to engineering equilibrium as surprising, but when you talk to him privately, he would always emphasize that uh, the main uh, achievement kind of, of finance is using arbitrage arguments to get a lot of mileage out of them because the conclusions you get in this manner are really robust. And uh, once you get into equilibrium, then you introduce a bunch of other overhead that you need to make it work, like, like preferences. and. Uh, then you're on shaky ground. So he was a very strong proponent of trying to do things in a preference-free way. And um, despite of the fact that some of his contributions, they are very much in the G uh, realm of things. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to add from my personal experience. And then I want to open the floor, because there are quite a few people here in the audience who have known Steve for a long time. So I'm hoping you will chime in with the comments. Uh, but when I was working on my own thesis, I thought of it at first as a, some kind of generalization of uh, Cox and Soros. It was also production economy, just two sectors, and uh, it was more flexible than their model. It had rich implications, I thought. And uh, because of that inspiration, I was trying to sort of follow the template and maybe make it a model about interest rates. At the end, it wasn't at all about interest rates. But what happened in the meantime is that uh, Phil Divick was visiting MIT. He probably, Phil, you probably don't remember. You came to give a seminar, and uh, I met with Phil for one of these PhD student kind of half an hour meetings. 
And Phil gently pointed out that he doesn't think this is a good model. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, not a good model of interest rates. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he basically it's not a good model of interest rates. Maybe do something else with it. Like think of it as a model of commodity prices or something, which eventually we actually did. So then I thought, fine, that's not very encouraging, but that's one opinion. Then I went and I talked to John Cox, who was, uh, uh, of course, a natural person. Talked to him, he was our chair at the time. And John kind of uh, said something similar. And um, at that point, I decided to rebrand the whole thing so that uh, it would not be a mode of interest rates and just emphasize equity implications. So by the time I talked to Steve, uh, it was already a different paper. And at that point, um, it actually was uh, a good, so third time around it worked. And Steve said, this is uh, very pretty. Uh, yeah. And then uh, he said, uh, I think Ken Arrow had a paper on this. I'm like, oh no. So <laughs> then I went on and I looked at it and it was not the same thing. So it was a very different. So that um, was quite fortunate. Uh, so one other thing that uh, I would like to uh, emphasize is that I mean, we, been talk we have been talking about this uh, since the morning as well. Like the fact that Steve cared deeply about the relevance of the research uh, in industry, he, its practical implications. Um, so I have a personal story about this. Um, I told you I was his RA, so at the beginning of my second year, I went to him, he was going to be my advisor. I thought, oh, I'm done. So he will suggest me, Steve Ross will suggest me a good topic, a thesis topic that I would be working on and that would be a wonderful topic, so my life will be easy. So I went uh, to him and asked him his suggestions and he looked at me and he said, read the newspaper. Um, there are, you know, very few moments when I got disappointed talking with Steve. Uh, that was one of them, you know, initially. Uh, I was disappointed that day, but later I realized this was the best advice that I have ever gotten. And um, I keep giving the same advice to my students as well. So he's just, this was definitely his approach to research. Thank you. So uh, let's open the floor to questions and comments. Jonathan, we have a mobile mic. John, I would like to, I saw the insight you gave with the fantastic. Do you have similar insights for the, for the binomial model? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in fact, our first paper, the one that I talked about, uh, really led directly uh, to the binomial model because in a sense the Although it was formulated in continuous time, the Poisson was, you could think of as a two-point process. Uh, and um, later, uh, Bill Sharp suggested that they would, it would be very good to, to put it into discrete time uh, as well. And we had never really thought about doing that, but it was an extremely valuable suggestion uh, because um, we then followed up on it. Uh, and uh, wrote the whole uh, model in discrete time. Um, uh, and uh, in that form, it could be made to converge either to the Black Scholes Martin model or to our uh, Poisson model. But the big advantage of doing it that way uh, was that it was so much easier to understand. Every step uh, uh, that one would take had a clear economic meaning. Uh, and it was also, um, uh, a, for most problems, a very efficient computational tool. I mean, you know, of course, these equations can be solved in, numerically in a lot of different ways, uh, but um, uh, the uh, binomial model gave a way that tied in uh, immediately with the economics of the problem and could be used to value, uh, for example, American options for which there was no uh, analytical formula. So is, <clears throat> you don't have any, any Steve, uh, you don't have any comparable story about Steve's involvement in the, in the project? Uh, well, uh, we, I mean, you, you, uh, S Steve and I were the joint authors of, of, uh, <laughs> of, of, the, of the Poisson paper, and 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 it followed directly from that. So. So what about uh, who did Steve? Uh, actually, um, 
Mark Rubens joined us uh, on this as well because it, it happened that both he and I were uh, teaching MBA courses on options. I think those were the first two MBA courses on options that were offered anywhere except maybe at MIT, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we were, uh, he as well as I were thinking about how to, how we were going to do that and, and get it across to, uh, uh, to MBA students. And the binomial model was the perfect thing for that. And uh, uh, Mark uh, actually was, uh, I think, the, uh, more than uh, Steve and me, you know, emphasized the computational side and how it could be used to uh, value American instruments. And that was an important part of the paper. I'm sorry, did that kind of, okay. Well, well, I thought so, but, they, but, but there wasn't an MBA. There, I said MBA, but there wasn't an MBA at MIT at that point. And, and the MS was like a doctoral course. So I'm not sure that that qualifies. <laughs> Any further questions, comments? All right, uh, let's uh, thank our panelists and uh, take a break uh, before the next section.